My name's James Morton, and this is my colleague, Stuart McManus. We teach in the Department of History here at the Chinese University of Hong Kong, and we specialize in the field of pre-modern world history. I'm a historian of medieval Europe and the Middle East, while Professor McManus's expertise is in the history of law and the humanities. We're delighted to be able to welcome you to the CUHK University Library today to introduce an exciting new teaching resource that we hope will enrich the student learning experience in world history. This is a project that we've undertaken with funding from the CUHK Senate Committee on Teaching and Learning and the generous support of the University Library Special Collections. The teaching of world history is an important part of the history curriculum at CUHK and contributes to the university's broader goals of internationalization and preparing students to play an active role on the global stage. Unfortunately, it's often difficult for students to get practical, hands-on experience in the field. There's no better way to understand the subject than to see it for yourself, but that can be quite challenging when the subject matter is thousands of miles away. That's right. This is especially true in light of the global COVID-19 pandemic, which has made it even harder for students to travel overseas and experience the material culture of world history in person. So we decided that if students couldn't travel from Hong Kong to see the world, then perhaps we could bring the world to Hong Kong. Together, we came up with the idea for this new teaching resource, which would allow CUHK students to learn about the material culture of the pre-modern world without ever having to leave home, keeping the core needs of the world history curriculum in mind. The result was the project that we're introducing to you today, Bringing Western History to Life, Material Culture of the Pre-Modern Western World. With the support of a university teaching development grant and the generous assistance of the team at University Library Special Collections, Professor McManus and I have assembled a collection of 43 important artifacts from pre-modern Western history that students can examine and learn from in hands-on classroom activities. The objects cover a wide chronological and geographical span, from Bronze Age Greece to the Roman Empire, medieval Europe, and even 16th century Mexico. Now, Professor Morton and I would love to host some original artifacts like the Rosetta Stone and the Elgin Marbles, but unfortunately, their current owners are unwilling to part with them. Instead, we sought out the most lifelike, museum-quality reproductions that we could find, making sure to acquire them from ethical producers using authentic historical production methods. Although we're unable to provide original museum pieces, we're pleased to say that the replica objects in our collection do an excellent job of conveying the look and feel of the items on which they're based. This also has the benefit that students can actually pick up and handle the objects, studying them up close in a way that would not be possible with the originals. We chose the specific items in the collection to represent a broad range of pre-modern culture dividing them up into seven categories, coins, manuscripts, jewelry, clothing, pottery, art and sculpture, and inscriptions. These categories not only reflect the general kinds of surviving artifacts from the pre-modern era, but they also give students an insight into a variety of important themes, including economic, intellectual, political, cultural, and social history. The pieces range from large, bulky sculptures like a 1st century AD bust of the Greek goddess Athena to small, delicate coins and items of jewelry. Each one of them has been described in detail in a catalogue that we put together specially with the aid of some of our dedicated, hardworking students in the Department of History. Personally, I'm most excited about our collection of highly detailed manuscript facsimiles, but the whole collection is made up of many fascinating objects. Students in world history courses at CUHK will be able to visit University Library Special Collections and study these objects as part of their class activities. In addition to getting to know the collection, students will be able to make use of it in their coursework, using the items in research papers, presentations, class discussions, and more. In this video, we'll introduce you to the objects in the collection taking you through each of the types of item that we've acquired and giving a brief description of each one. You'll get to see each of the pieces that we collected and learn how we plan to use them in teaching future classes in world history. Let's take a look at the collection then, shall we? Our collection begins with a set of five silver coins from ancient Greece, uh, three of which are from the classical Greek world and two of which belong to the Hellenistic era. 
Of the three classical Greek coins, uh, two are of the type known as a tetrodrachm, uh, which uh, comes from the Greek uh, words tetra and drachme, meaning uh, four kinds of drachma, which is a kind of uh, ancient Greek silver coin. The first coin comes from the city of Athens in Greece in the late 5th century BC. It bears an image of the goddess Athena on one side, and on the other side it bears an image of the owl, which is a symbol of wisdom and the animal with which Athena is usually associated. The second coin uh, comes from the city of Syracuse in Sicily, uh, again from the late 5th century BC. On one side, it bears an image of the goddess Arethusa, who is the patron goddess of Syracuse, surrounded by four dolphins. Um, and on the other side, it bears an image of a four-horse chariot, or tetrapon. The third coin, uh, of a type known as a stator, or standard coin, comes from the city of Thebes in the early 4th century BC. Uh, on the one side, it bears an image of an amphora or jug full of oil, and on the other side, it bears an image of a, a special kind of infantryman's shield from the city of Thebes. The letters that you can see are an abbreviation of the name of the magistrate who is in charge of the city at the time of the coin's minting. Our fourth coin here it comes from the Seleucid Empire. It is a coin of the Seleucid king uh, Seleucus I, Nicator, or the Victorious, who was originally one of Alexander the Great's generals. Uh, but in the late 4th century BC, after Alexander's death, he had this coin minted in uh, the center of his kingdom, which is in modern-day Iran. On the one side, it bears an image of Alexander the Great himself in divine form. And on the other side, it bears an image of Zeus sitting on his throne, uh, bearing an eagle, which is the symbol of Zeus. Uh, lastly, from this group, we have a coin of the uh, Hellenistic king Lysimachus, who was again another one of Alexander the Great's generals who established a kingdom after the ruler's death, uh, this time in the region of Thrace in the southeastern Balkans. On the one side, this coin bears an image of Lysimachus himself um, in the same appearance as Alexander. And on the other side, it bears an image of the goddess Athena uh, bearing uh, the smaller goddess Nike in her hand, uh, who symbolizes victory. Let's look at some Roman coins now, shall we? Here we have four coins ranging from the first century BCE to the second century CE. The first is the famous Brutus coin, minted under Marcus Junius Brutus, who was involved in the conspiracy against Caesar. This is represented on the back of the coin where we see the Pileus, or freedom cap, alongside two daggers, and underneath the date of Caesar's assassination, the Ides of March, that's to say March 15th. The second coin is a coin of the Emperor Vespasian. He became emperor after the Julio-Claudian dynasty and inaugurated the Flavian dynasty. This took place after the famous Year of Four Emperors in 69 CE. Staying with the Flavian dynasty, the third coin is of Trajan, an emperor who was famous for his conciliating approach to the Senate, as represented on the back of the coin by the personification of the virtue of prudentia, or prudence. The final Roman coin in our collection was minted under the philosopher emperor Marcus Aurelius. His reign was characterized by an ongoing war to the north with the Germanic Marcomanni tribe. This is represented on the reverse of the coin, which shows captured Marcomanni armor. Marcus Aurelius is also remembered as a philosopher, in particular for his interest in Stoic philosophy. Moving into the medieval period, we have uh, five coins from Europe, uh, one from the Byzantine Empire, and then four from Germany and Eastern Europe. 
and we can immediately see the change in style from the Greek and Roman coins of antiquity as they become smaller and less elo elegant. Uh, first of all, we have here a gold coin from the Byzantine Empire known as a solidus from the middle of the 9th century. This bears a portrait of the Emperor Michael the Amorian, and in one hand he's holding a kind of banner called a labarum, and in the other hand he is holding a kind of a cloth known as an akakia, which wards off evil. On the other side of the coin, it bears an image of Jesus Christ, reflecting the Christian nature of the empire and the general Christian culture of the medieval period. Moving to the second coin here, we have a silver Sachsenpfennig, or Saxon penny, as it is known, from the city of Magdeburg from the late 10th century. Magdeburg was founded by the Emperor Charlemagne, who is a ruler of the Carolingian Empire in the late 8th and the early 9th century. This is one of the successor states to the Roman Empire in Central Europe. And this is a coin of the type known as a bracteate, which means that instead of being uh, molded on both sides, a simple image is stamped into one side, and so it bears the same image on both sides of the coin. Uh, and this is a very simple image of a Christian cross. The third coin in the row here uh, comes from uh, the eastern part of Europe, from the Balkans. It is a coin of Duchess Emma of Melnik, uh, again from the late 10th century. Um, fourth, then, we have a coin of Stephen I of Hungary one of the first Christian kings of Hungary. And again, it repeats the Christian imagery that we've come to expect. Um, and lastly, we have a coin here of Conrad I of Bohemia from the 11th century. Um, this again bears very Christian imagery, although this time slightly more complex and better produced. On the one side, it bears an image of a church, uh, and on the other side, it bears the image of a cross. The final coin in the collection is from the 17th century. However, as you can see, the style is very similar to the earlier coins. This is because during the Renaissance, coins were in fact modeled on ancient Roman examples. The coin you see here is of Ferdinand III, Archduke of Austria and Holy Roman Emperor. It was during his reign that the Thirty Years' War took place, and the famous Peace of Westphalia was signed. Our manuscript collection begins with a set of papyrus fragments from the 3rd century AD from late Roman Egypt. Uh, this is known as the Bodmer 8 papyrus because it was discovered by the Swiss book collector Martin Bodmer in the 19th century. Uh, papyrus is a very common material in Egypt and was very often used for uh, producing manuscripts at the time. And due to the very dry conditions of the countryside, um, it met, has meant that uh, papyrus fragments from Egypt have survived in quite large numbers. The manuscript itself consists of a selection from the first and second letters of the New Testament epistles of St. Peter. And we can tell from the uh, very uh, informal nature of the script, which is in Greek, that it was probably meant for personal private use rather than public use in a church setting. Our next book comes from the fourth century AD. This is the famous Vatican Virgil, a copy of the pastoral poems known as the Georgics by the first century BCE Roman poet Virgil. This copy is important because it's the first existent manuscript of this monumental work in Western poetry. It is in codex form and written in uncial capitals, which can be clearly read today. There's also later marginalia from the late Middle Ages or the early Renaissance noting the title and adding certain comments. We have two manuscripts from the medieval period, one from Christian Europe and the other from the Islamic world. The first of these is Codex Vindobonensis 652 uh, on my left here from the late 9th century. This comes from a monastery in Germany known as Fulda 
and so it dates to the late Carolingian period. This is a particularly interesting manuscript. Uh, it is a copy of a series of poems known as the Picture Poems by the monk Rabanus Maurus, who lived in the 8th century. And the book contains a series of poems uh, about the Holy Cross, so it's central to Christian theology, as you can imagine. On my right here, from the late 12th century, from the 1190s, we have a series of reproductions of uh, pages from a manuscript of the Kitab al-Diryak, or um, the Book of uh, Animal Medicines. It's uh, actually a kind of medicine known in ancient Greek as theriaca, which was uh, supposed to be a cure-all or a panacea for various types of uh, poisons and other kinds of animal uh, bites that a person might receive. Um, this is an extremely uh, luscious, uh, elegant manuscript, um, which was clearly intended uh, as a gift for a very wealthy patron, quite likely. Uh, and it contains a number of impressive images um, of the kinds of medicines and the kinds of animals that they were intended for. The next item is the Tabula Putingeriana. This is a 13th century copy of a much earlier Roman map, or more precisely, a member of the genre of the Itineraria Picta. That is to say, road maps that show how to get from one place to another. This particular one is vast and covers the area from the west, uh, the Straits of Gibraltar, as we call them today, to the far east of the known world to the Romans, India. Along the way, you pass through many famous cities, which are all marked. And some cities are even represented by personifications, such as Rome. This is probably the finest example of early European map making. The next item comes from the Americas. This is the famous Codex Borbonicus, produced in the 16th century by indigenous Aztec or Mexica artists in the long-standing Aztec style. Looking closely at the manuscript, we see the lavish indigenous style illustrations first of the calendrical material and then of the ritual and cultural material in the last third of the manuscript. You'll also note the Spanish marginalia explaining the Aztec pictograms. Moving on to our collection of jewelry, the earliest item is a pendant in the shape of two bees or wasps from the early second millennium BC. This was produced by the ancient Minoan civilization, which was from the island of Crete, which is in modern day Greece. This particular item was found in the city of Malia and is today in the Heraklion Archaeological Museum. Despite its extremely old age, it has been called uh, the crowning achievement of early Minoan goldworking, and easily stands up there alongside some of the finest jewelry, even of the modern day. It's thought that besides the two bees, the three hanging pendants at the bottom may represent some kind of herb or plant which is native to the island of Crete. The next item is a gold Roman pendant from the British Museum. This is in the form of a bunch of grapes a very familiar object to any Roman, given the prominence of wine and the culture of wine in ancient Rome. Indeed, the Roman statesman and orator Cicero had a particular taste for importing exotic wines from Greece, as well as producing them on his own estate. And this was typical of the Roman elite. We also have two items of early medieval jewelry, the first of which is a pair of gold and garnet gem earrings from a very famous burial site in England in the 7th century known as Sutton Hoo. 
This was discovered uh, by a, a group of amateur archaeologists in the year 1939, and it consists of a ship burial uh, in which a royal person of the Anglo-Saxons uh, was discovered, along with many of these extremely exquisite pieces like these two earrings here. On the right, we then have a pair of brooches in the shape of tortoises, so they're called tortoise-type brooches, uh, from Erland in Sweden. Uh, they're also known as Birka-type brooches because many of them are associated with the city of Birka in Sweden, uh, which was an important political and commercial center in the early Middle Ages. These are made of bronze and they date to the 8th to 10th centuries. Um, although they are quite elegant, uh, it's hard to say whether they would have been worn by an aristocratic person or perhaps someone of slightly lower rank. And they bear typical Scandinavian designs from the period. From later in the Middle Ages, we have another two pieces, one from the Byzantine Empire from the 10th century and another one from 14th century England. On my left, we have a peacock brooch made of bronze uh, with pearls set around the outer ring. Uh, this was discovered in an archaeological site at Preslav in Bulgaria, uh, known as the Preslav Treasure. And although it was Bulgarian, um, it uh, was probably brought to the region from the Byzantine Empire itself. In the Eastern Christian world, particularly in Byzantine culture, the peacock represents paradise or heaven in the afterlife. On my right here, we have something that would have been worn by a middle or upper class woman in late medieval England. It is a spiral hairpin made of brass. Um, in those days, women would have worn their hair in quite elaborate hairstyles covered with an item known as a wimple, a decorative piece, which would have been fixed in place with a long spiral hairpin such as this. Um, it's thought that this style was probably popularized by a queen of Denmark in the early 14th century. The next two items are fibulae, or clothes pins. The first from around 1000 BCE, and the second from around 1 to 200 CE. Both objects are from Northern Europe and were designed to hold together clothes just as buttons or zips would today. The one on the left shows a typical Northern European style, whereas the one on the right is an example of the fusion of Germanic, Celtic, and Roman styles in the wake of Roman expansion into Northern and Central Europe. Our early medieval jewellery comes mainly from Eastern Europe, first of which, on my left here, is a 7th century bow fibula, which is a type of brooch, uh, so named because it is in the sh loose shape of a bow. Um, hundreds of these bow fibulae have been discovered from across Eastern Europe, and scholars over the years have tried to associate them with various different cultures from the region, such as Vandals or Gepids or Lombards, the most recent scholarship, however, associates this with a group of people known as the Avars, who were a nomadic tribe from Central Asia who migrated into Central and Eastern Europe in the 7th century. And then on my right, we have two clasps uh, from Russia from the 10th century. These are Slavic raven clasps. Again, many examples of these have been found from not only Russia itself, but also neighboring Scandinavia and regions of Eastern Europe. Uh, these represent the Slavic artistic tradition and are some of the earliest surviving examples of medieval Russian clothing. Unlike in some of the earlier pieces we've seen, which are brooches that would fasten clothing together, uh, these clasps do not, in fact, have a pin to fasten them, uh, but are simply intended to help bunch up and wrap clothing around the person. Yeah. The last item in our collection of medieval clothing is this 10th century Byzantine belt, uh, made of leather with metal fittings. Now, leather, of course, is a perishable material, so the original leather has since uh, disappeared, it has rotted away, and only the metal fittings 
survive to the present day. Uh, this reproduces the leather material to give you some idea of what it might have originally looked like. Now, although uh, this Byzantine belt uh, originally would have come from the Mediterranean world, this particular set of metal belt fittings was in fact also found in the city of Bjorka in Sweden. It might seem quite strange to discover Byzantine belt fittings all the way up in Sweden, far to the north. However, this just attests to the uh, extremely extensive trading networks that existed in the medieval period between the Viking world of Sweden and Scandinavia and the Mediterranean world of Byzantium. The Vikings had a very long shared history with the Byzantines, most famously sending Viking soldiers all the way down to the Byzantine Empire to serve as the Varangian guards or the bodyguards of the Byzantine Emperor. And so this belt is still further evidence of the depths of those contacts. Moving on to our pottery collection, we have three items from the ancient Greek world, two of which date to the Bronze Age and the third of which dates to the Classical period. On my left here, we have a terracotta conical vase from the Cycladic uh, civilization, named after the Cyclades Islands in Greece, in the Aegean Sea, where the civilization flourished. You can see it has a very simple geometric pattern and does not have any complicated artistic elements. This dates to the third millennium BC. Directly in front of me here in the middle, we have an object from the middle of the second millennium BC, um, again from the Minoan civilization uh, from the island of Crete in Greece. This is known as the octopus flask for the obvious reason that it has a very famous painting of an octopus on it. And around the rest of the flask, there are also various other sea creatures painted around as well, like fish and starfish and so on. Um, this reflects the maritime nature of the Minoan civilization, the fact that they lived on an island and got a lot of their livelihood from the sea, uh, from fishing and from trade. Then lastly, on my right here, uh, we have the Odysseus Stamnos. A Stamnos is a kind of jug again, uh, from the early 5th century BC from the city of Athens. This uh, stamnos or jug represents a scene from the famous epic poem, The Odyssey by the Greek poet Homer. Uh, in this scene, we see Odysseus and his men sailing uh, through the, the straits of, uh, of Scylla and Charybdis. Um, alongside, we see the sirens, the mythical monsters who tries to entice sailors off course and lure them to their death. Here we can see Odysseus uh, tied to the mast of his ship so that he can't uh, try to escape and follow the sound of the siren's song. Um, meanwhile, his men who are rowing have their ears stopped so that they can't hear it either. Um, he is able to see the direction where the ship is going uh, and they are able to row. Uh, and using this system, they were able to escape the lure of the sirens. The next two items are typical Roman household objects. The first is a so-called sigillata bowl. This was the Ikea crockery of its time, mass-produced and found right across the empire. This particular example is not based on any Roman original. Rather, it combines elements of various objects from the time to give something of a generic type. This would have been used for eating regular meals from. The second item then is a lamp with three holes for wicks and in the center, a hole for inserting the oil, which would be burned. This hole takes the form of the mouth of Oceanus a Greek god, the god, in fact, of fresh water. Such lamps were typical in Roman households and in other buildings. We see a distinct change in style when we move to the medieval items in our pottery collection. Here we have three pieces, two from uh, the early Middle Ages and one from the late Middle Ages. On my left here, we have a 5th century Anglo-Saxon urn discovered in Norfolk in the southeast of England. 
This was discovered in a cemetery and was likely used to contain the ashes of a cremated deceased person. However, it may not have originally been intended for this purpose. It was quite common in that period of history for ordinary household containers such as this to later be reused as cremation urns. You can see the, from the design, it has a very simple uh, Germanic style, uh, much less uh, technically sophisticated than many of the pieces from the Greek and the Roman world. Similar to the Anglo-Saxon urn, uh, in front of me in the middle here, we have a jug from the Viking Age from Scandinavia. It likely dates to the um, late 8th to the early 11th centuries. And this was discovered at the town of Durham in Denmark, which was right in the middle of the Viking world at the time. You can see, again, we have a very simple Germanic artistic style, quite similar in many ways to the Anglo-Saxon uh, cremation urn from a few centuries earlier. And then lastly, on my right, we have a green glazed jug from late medieval England. This dates to the 14th or 15th centuries. And it was discovered under uh, Corn Market Street in Oxford. Uh, the original version of this is currently in the Ashmolean Museum there. And this is a, a humorous piece, so it's meant to represent a whimsical bearded man's face with a raised eyebrow, um, meant to be a fun item. And would have likely been used for simple household drinking. Um, and so that's the end of our medieval pottery collection. The earliest piece in our collection of art and sculpture is a reproduction of a section of the Parthenon frieze from ancient Athens. This was created in the middle of the fifth century BC and originally would have decorated uh, the upper parts of the walls of the Parthenon temple dedicated to the goddess Athena on the Acropolis in the city of Athens. Uh, nowadays, it is controversially located in the British Museum after it was removed from Greece in the 19th century uh, by Thomas Bruce, the seventh Earl of Elgin, um, who also gives his name to the collection of marbles to which this belongs, the Elgin marbles, as they are famously known. Now, in this section of the frieze, which would have run around the entire walls of the temple, um, we see two horsemen who are riding in part of a procession, uh, a religious procession in honor of the goddess Athena. This would have been a regular civic ritual for the city of Athens, um, not only representing the people's devotion to the goddess Athena herself, but also helping to build the community identity of the Athenian people too. The next item is the so-called Warren Cup, now housed in the British Museum. This is a first century CE silvered Roman drinking cup found in Palestine, which in this period was part of the Roman Empire. It is important for Roman social history because it depicts Roman homosexuality. In fact, two sex acts between two men of different ages. This shows that before the advent of Christianity, in ancient Greece and Rome, attitudes to homosexuality were very different to what they would later become in the West. The next item is interesting because it's a copy of a copy. This is a modern reproduction of a first century CE Roman copy of a Greek fourth century CE original. Indeed, this sort of Roman copy of a Greek original was very common as the Romans highly esteemed Greek statuary. This particular example is a bust of Athena the patron goddess of the city of Athens, and was discovered in Rome in the late 18th century. The Egyptians, Etruscans, and Romans all liked to bury their dead in elaborate stone sarcophagi. Here is an example of a third century CE Roman sarcophagus, or at least a part of it, now held in the Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum in Boston.
This example, originally found on the grounds of Villa Farnese in Rome, depicts a party being celebrated by satyrs and maenads, followers of the god Bacchus, the god of wine. You can see in the depiction, these satyrs and maenads are drinking and having a good time. The next item is also from a fourth century CE sarcophagus. This time, not a Roman mythological scene, but a Christian symbol, the so-called Chi Rho, the first two letters in Greek of the name of Jesus. In addition, there are another two Greek letters, Alpha and Omega, a reference to the New Testament, where Jesus says that he is the beginning, the first letter of the Greek alphabet, Alpha, and also the end, Omega. This ivory case would have originally been the cover to a mirror. It dates to the year 1300 or thereabouts, and it was originally produced in Paris in France. It's currently housed in the Louvre Museum. Now, as the covering for a mirror, this would likely have been used by a young aristocratic woman, and it portrays the sorts of things that young aristocratic uh, French women in the Middle Ages might have had on their mirror cases. Here we have a scene of courtly romance um, representing a young aristocratic man on the left-hand side playing chess against a young aristocratic woman, and each of them have their servants standing behind them giving them advice. Now, this is a metaphor for the uh, courtly duel of love in which uh, men and women would have engaged, the, with the game of chess symbolizing the sort of battle that would go on between the two of them as the man fought to win the woman's love. The next item is an oat relief of virgin and child by the early Renaissance artist Benedetto da Maiano. This is a long-standing form of iconography that we see here in its Renaissance form with increased realism and indeed a very human touch with the baby Jesus touching the hem of the Virgin's dress. Moving on to inscriptions, our first piece here is from the second millennium BC. It is a Bronze Age uh, inscribed disc from the town of Phaistos in Crete. It was produced again by the Minoan civilization uh, that ruled that region of Greece at the time. And the disc is inscribed with various symbols or pictograms, which represent an extremely early form of Greek writing. Now, the scholars have not yet been able to actually decipher what these pictograms actually mean, because unfortunately, not enough examples of this script have managed to survive until the present day. So the actual contents of the disc are still a mystery. However, we can say that it most likely represents a very early form of the Greek language as it would have been spoken on the island of Crete. This was discovered in a Minoan royal palace, and so one possibility is that it may represent perhaps some kind of dedication or perhaps even uh, some sort of record of items that might have been stored in the palace at the time. The last item is the Rosetta Stone, a famous ancient artifact discovered in the 19th century and used to decipher Egyptian hieroglyphs. This is a trilingual inscription, first in ancient Egyptian, then in a later form of the language, not a hieroglyphic form, demotic, and then finally in Greek. Some of the interesting features uh, you will note include the cartouche in the ancient Greek hieroglyphic section, representing the name of a ruler, and then the very clear Greek script. That concludes our overview of the collection. We would once again like to thank the Senate Committee on Teaching and Learning for funding this project, and the University Library Special Collections for kindly housing and displaying the objects. 
and thank you for taking the time to watch this video and get to know our collection with us. If you're a student who's interested in taking classes in world history, then we look forward to welcoming you to see the collection for yourself in the not too distant future. Even if you aren't a student, you'll be able to see some of the items on permanent display in the reading room of the University Library Special Collections. We're very excited to share this collection with all of you and bring pre-modern Western history to life at CUHK. Goodbye. Bye-bye.